over to you, Leanne. Thank you very much. Thanks. No pressure, given that you had Mike Green this morning. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah, look, um, in some conversations with Dee around, um, you know, one of the things that I'm passionate about is, is, is people having good lives in community. And part of that for us is about people being able to um, live their life with people that they choose to have around them in the places that are meaningful for them. And um, one of the things that's, that continues to show up, and given I've been in the disability sector for 35 odd years now, and, um, you know, come from so, like walking alongside and supporting people in institutions to smaller sort of hostels and group homes. And the last 15, 18 years has been specifically around individualised services and individualised living where people are able to have their own place and uh, not have to be uh, congregated with other people with disability simply based on funding or um, the service system requirements. So. One of the things that I, um, I'm just going to share with you, um, just it's only a couple of slides. Um, can you guys see that? Yep, we can see that. Okay, great. So one of the things that when thinking about individualised living and some of the, um, I guess even linking it with some things today is that we know that we've moved from this institutional approach to, I guess it was considered care or is considered care. Um, and then I guess more individualized living is, or more tailored and contemporary support is about people being able to be citizens within their community and, um, and their rights being able to be exercised and upheld. And I guess one of the things that um, continues to show up is that there's so institutions, not so many here in Australia. Um, there are still some, but not so many. Um, there's lots and lots of, I guess, of the care element of support. Um, and the care element of support that we see um, that people uh, sometimes um, absolutely choose for themselves or their families choose for them. Um, is traditionally what we see is that um, that the supports that people have sometimes, even with really awesome people that are supporting them, is that it can be restricted to being in community but not with community, um, people around them but not with them. Um, relationships with really great people who are providing paid support, but many people, certainly many people I've known over the over the course of my career, um, have had uh, not many unpaid or, I guess, what we'd call you know reciprocal relationships, um, especially when they're in living arrangements that continue to congregate people based on system needs. So the um, one of the things that um, I guess I feel really passionate about is this, the impact of continuing to, um, for people not to have reciprocal relationships based in community. Um, so one of the things that, um, I don't know if you've seen the Citizen Network and the Keys to Citizenship that Simon Duffy um, developed, but those, those elements of love, freedom, money, home, help, um, life and purpose um, are, the, are the keys that Simon talks about in um, having, I guess, a good life, having the things that we all want. And so when we reflect back on this, the care and support and within its own sort of service land to move towards um, citizenship, um, I guess what what complete well, I guess what continues to show up is that the keys to citizenship or those elements can be sometimes ignored or forgotten by the system. And what we see with the impact of that, I guess, is um, 
is the impact on relationships and how um, when people don't have reciprocal relationships in the way that um, that is, I guess, that involves trust and mutual respect and reciprocity and um, then we see that people are more at risk of having not so great things happen to them. David Petonyak talks about, and some of you may know David, he talks about, he's did a bit of a video and you, you, I'm sure you'll find it on YouTube um, or I can send you guys the link. He talks about the difference between coverage and relationships and how um, lots of the time when it's just paid support within service land, um, it's more about coverage. So who's going to turn up today? Who's on the next shift? Um, as opposed to this idea of who are we in relationship with, um, where we also may have help. If you see the case of citizenship, we may have help, but we also have love, we have purpose, we have home. Um, so I guess in these, what I've seen over the years is that the more, the more it looks like service land, the more at risk people are of having system responses to their supports as opposed to um, uh, human or community responses. Uh, we, we see that especially when times are challenging. So as an example, we may see that um, when people want to explore what their purpose in life is, in a service land type of approach, the system will look at, well, what have we already got in our system that we can default to, um, the, whether it be the sheltered workshop or the um, disabled dance group. And I'm not judging any of those. I'm just saying that becomes the default. It may not necessarily be an explored choice. So we often see that it becomes easier to default to what the system already um, has on offer instead of what is it that we haven't explored yet that we might need to create. And so that coverage or relationship element to it and how that links with home has been really important, um, I guess, over many years to see that connection show up. And one of the things, although it's COVID related, um, historically over many years, where we've seen that sort of coverage or relationship system response versus community response, um, it continues to show up at times where it's challenging or um, say where someone might use their behaviour to communicate what it is they need. Sometimes the responses can be more system focused, not community focused. When people might be seeking to do things in community, the response may be more system focused, i.e. what have we already got, as opposed to what has the community got? What, what are the assets in our community that people can link into? Um, we see it with decision making. So um, when people wanna be supported to make their own decisions, often there'll be system responses about duty of care or um, you know, managing risk. Um, as opposed to a community response, which is, well, what are any of us doing and who's looking out for us in making decisions and what are our safeguards that we're thinking about for ourselves or for our loved ones? And the same thing goes with exploring a good life for someone. So the responses, the system response is, well, where is there a group home with a vacancy that someone can move into? Um, as opposed to, well, how are any of us living and what's the right way within our finances, within our, with our supports that we need, with the people we want around us? Um, so that's, I guess, they're the things that, are, that continue to show up over time, but n no time has been greater within the, these COVID responses. So people who are more We've seen it in aged care settings. This is in Australia in WA, so I'm not, I can't say for any other country, but where people are in more care type of arrangements, whether that be an aged nursing home or a, um, or a 
a, a residential facility or, or a sort of larger group living arrangement that the responses have been system orientated where like if there's been an older person or a person with a disability that may have um, been exposed to COVID, the responses have been community-based, relationship-based, maintaining relationships, you know, reducing isolation. And it's been a community or a, a, the relationships around the person became critically important to, um, to keep everything okay and to safeguard each other. So I just thought it was an interesting, um, I, I just thought it was interesting in these times of COVID that outside of a service setting, we can still default to um, a service system response when you're in a service system setting. And the, the differences of, as an example, in the UK, um, I was, I've, we've, um, we connect sometimes with um, Shared Lives Plus and the Shared Lives, um, there's been a few Shared Lives supporter. That's where a person with a disability will live in or, or someone who has, um, who's ageing lives in a, a home with someone else that um, provides them with support. And so there's, uh, there's examples that have come through there that where the, the person providing the support in their home has passed away from having COVID but the relationships because of that environment created such a safe space to support the person and what else they needed on top of that through that process, as opposed to, you know, there are people where that have been in, I guess, larger system orientated um, arrangements where the response has been very service orientated. So people can only visit at certain times or not visit at all to keep everybody safe. So, and I'm not judging the, the reasons why that needs to be, by the way, it's just an interesting difference um, in terms of responses. So that, um, that was where, that, that was my intention of having a discussion around that and hearing from you guys from all over the world about, well, one, your thoughts on some of that and also um, what, you guys might be seeing um, that's showing up with the differences of system responses to support people or community responses to support people. Thanks, Leanne. Um, just if you leave those keys up for a second, it's, it's the first thing that's coming to mind for me, and I had not put these three together yet, which I love, um, is you know, Mike Green talks about building the bridge from client to citizen. So, you know, we're bringing someone from the peripheral or even service land to the centre. Um, and he talks about the steps, you know, of doing that. I hadn't considered the keys could be on that bridge. You know, they're, they're, so, they're like stepping stones almost that are there. Um, and I know there's the, the, is it the five valued experiences from... Um, the inclusion movement, yeah. Um, but the, these keys to citizenship, I think, are a bit stronger than that in the language they're talking about bringing that person to the centre. Um, do, do you see that or is am I making it up? <laughs> you asking me or the group? Um, you first, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Like, it's one of the things that, you know, someone may have um, some elements of help, but don't have any freedom or autonomy or power within within that help or within the home or with their money. Um, so those elements of those, they're definitely building blocks around the things that help us to exercise and be citizens within our community. Yeah. Our contribution, our all the, the five valued experiences that O'Brien's talk about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being valued, being, you know, contributing, um, being respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's up to you if you leave your screen share up or not. You can let it down. 